Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon at the Charleston Literary Festival with T.S. Eliot and our two speakers, Lyndall Gordon and Bill Goldstein. And also a big shout out and thank you to our sponsors, Sam Easley and Jason Owen for all their generosity. Thank you, Sam and Jason. So this is the first of two events celebrating the centenary of the publication of The Wasteland, the modernist poem by the American poet T.S. Eliot, which changed the course of literary history. There couldn't be two more qualified speakers to provide some insights into T.S. Eliot's life, loves and creativity than Lyndall Gordon and Bill Goldstein. Lyndon is an award-winning biographer, including Charlotte Bronte, Mary Wollstonecroft, Virginia Woolf, and T.S. Eliot. She was born in South Africa and has had a long academic career at Oxford University in England. Her current book, Hyacinth Girl, Girl T.S. Eliot's Hidden Muse, is a major revelation. It draws on a dramatic cache of 1,131, hope I've got that right, Lyndall, letters, only unsealed this year, which Eliot wrote to Emily Hale, his long-standing and hitherto barely known American muse and confidant, after he left America to spend the rest of his adult life in England. Bill Goldstein is the author of The World Broken Two, which examines the pivotal year in English literature, 1922, 100 years ago, through four writers and their great works, including T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, the other three writers being Virginia Woolf, Ian Forster, and D.H. Lawrence. Bill is editor of the New York Times Books website and book critic for the weekend edition of WNB WNBC's Today New York. He's currently writing the authorised biography of Larry Kramer. So I'm delighted to hand over to Linda and Bill, but Linda's going to start off with some in, an interesting presentation with some very uh, um, uh, uh, special images. So welcome again, <laughs> Linda and Bill. Thank you, Diana. Among the greatest of all-time poets, Eliot's priority was the timeless. At the heart of his art was a spiritual search to validate his line in four quartets, in my end is my beginning. Concurrent with that search is his eye to a timeless posthumous existence for his poetry. To achieve these aims, he co-opted four women. Three of these were English women, his first and second wives, and a church-going companion. But this visible poet concealed a lifelong love, as Diana said, for an American called Emily Hale, an actor, director of plays, and drama teacher, to whom for 25 years he wrote privately and regularly over a thousand letters. Emily Hale was the source of, quote, memory and desire at the opening of The Wasteland. She is his hyacinth girl in that poem, a memory of young love escaping the present waste of a dull existence in post-war London. Eliot's 1,131 letters to this woman, released at last in the next century, the century, open up what has been a hidden drama. Now we can see and hear Eliot's, quote, Lady of Silences, the first and consistently crucial figure in his life and art. There were other spirited women who shaped him, Vivian, the flamboyant first wife 
with whom he shared a private wasteland. And later this afternoon, you'll hear Ballerini reading the wasteland, read part two, which uh, Pound, who helped to edit the wasteland before publication, um, that part is co uh, he calls uh, scrawled in the margin too photographic. He thought this was too um, close to home, this portrait of a nervy wife trying to hold on to a husband whose mind shears off back to the Hyacinth girl. Then there was Mary Trevelyan, his companion in prayer, and Valerie Fletcher, the young disciple to whom he proposed late in his life, when his relationship with Emily, as he always called her, founded. Em Eliot kept these women apart as each ignited his transformations as poet, expatriate, convert, and finally, in his last years, what his second wife called him, a man made for love. The letters especially the second, dated the 3rd of November, 1930, are explicit about Hale's appearances in his poems. It's now clear that she inspired certain lines he wrote to last beyond his lifetime. Not only the hyacinth girl holding flowers, um, and Eliot writes to Emily Hale that um, he felt um, dazed and, and enraptured so much so, I the poem goes, I could not speak, looking into the heart of light, the silence. But he also remembered her as the rose, capital R, the rose of memory and the lady of silences. And also a silent or silenced woman a one-time love who accompanies the speaker to the Rose Garden of Bert Norton in England, in Gloucestershire, um, which uh, that, that garden that forms the subject of one of Eliot's greatest poems, Bert Norton, the first of the quartets. Emily Hale was also the source for female roles in Eliot's completed plays between 1939 and 1958. To read Eliot's twice-weekly letters to Emily during the 1930s and 1940s is to enter the beating heart of the poets and playwrights art. Eliot wrote hundreds more letters to Emily than to anyone else and set up the longest embargo for any of his writings. The embargo was to last, he said, 50 years from the death of the survivor. What was Eliot determined to keep from his own generation and the one that followed? Two moves in his last years were to burn Emily's side of the correspondence and then, astonishingly, to write a letter to posterity denying any substance to the relationship. The letters themselves tell a different story what is revealed is an adoring relationship with a woman of innate goodness who could bring on the redeeming moments in his poetry, like looking into the heart of like the silence, one of the non-wasteland moments in the wasteland. These are moments that escape the waste of daily existence. This relationship spanned his creative years as poet and dramatist from the age of 24 to his late 60s. The hidden muse story is filled with emotional meetings and partings, embraces and fantasies, questions about divorce, and very important differences to do with faith. And it turns out that the story did not quite end after Eliot's secretary, Valerie Fletcher, stepped in to become the second Mrs. Eliot during the last eight years of the poet's life. He continued to worry about Emily, to brood about the huge cache of letters that were legally in her possession. Eliot guarded his privacy in what was then a male world of college, work, clubs, and coteries, like Ezra Pound's Men of 1914, 
and he guarded himself with an insistence on impersonality. He told Emily Hale that he was wearing a mask all his life and needed the openness of their correspondence to put posterity, that's us, right. Emily Hale was the first of the four women who came closer to an insistently distant poet and saw him in ways men do not. All four communicated their experience with him. Most outspoken was Vivian Haywood, his first wife, whose voice he feared. She left her autobiographical sketches and diaries to the Bodleian Library in Oxford. His sturdy companion in prayer, Mary Trevelyan, was explicit in her memoir about falling in love and her difficulties with Eliot. And his secretary, Miss Fletcher, said yes to all he asked of her and continued all her life to guard and perpetuate his preferred story. Each of these women felt a profound attraction, no ordinary emotion, that made for a permanent bond on the woman's part. Each of the four who entered Eliot's private life was a rare woman in her own way and keenly perceptive. Eliot was ready to recognise Emily Hale's distinction as, quote, saint, so he called her, and a professional when it came to drama. She was someone to consult about his plays, particularly the family reunion. Her vocation as an actor appealed to the dramatist in Eliot, and over the years there were many roles for her and triumphant productions, but, and it's a big but, never in the commercial theatre. It was not then considered proper for a woman of the Boston elite. Eliot, who came from the same Boston Brahmin background, called her my lady. It stirred his feeling to imagine her a medieval lady, like Dante's Beatrice, at once a living woman and a guide to what lies beyond life. As Dante met Beatrice when she was a child, Eliot met Emily, we now know from the letters, much earlier than we'd be, we thought. They met in 1905, when she was just turned 14, and already declaring her commitment to the theatre. In 1905, that year, Eliot turned 17, and at that time, he had completed high school in his native St. Louis and entered Milton Academy, the boarding school near Boston. A later poem, Anna Mueller, describes a growing boy who finds his soul, quote, misshapen, selfish, irresolute, too hesitant to act. This poor soul backs away from human warmth and fears, quote, the offered good. To Emily, he spoke of a damaged childhood, a late child born with a disability to elderly parents. He said to her, I had to find out by painful and humiliating experience that I was not so good as I took for granted. A bitter lesson in humility. Eliot's are not naturally humble. The encounter of a troubled youth with natural goodness in a young girl distills the entire tie to Emily Hale, going back to what he and she had been when they first knew each other. As well as her kind smile, her special asset was her voice, one in millions, he told her, when less shy. As, quote, children, Eliot would recall, we were both too shy and reserved to have real conversation. A poem he wrote later when he was an expatriate in London calls her Pippet, a little pip of a person to whom a warped Europeanized speaker, beset by an old world of fornication and despair, looks back with longing. Irredeemable as the speaker is, he cherishes a memory of innocence. In the end, Eliot silenced Emily Hale because she had a different story to tell. It was not the narrative he wished to leave with readers. That narrative centres his second wife, Valerie, in place of Emily as the love of his life. 
Elliot's belated rejection of Emily is a story in itself, and it ends with the blow he dealt her in the letter to posterity to be circulated to the media when his letters were disclosed to the next century. The blow, as she rose into public view, was designed to erase her. I first heard of the letters in 1972 when, as a student in New York, I went to talk about Elliot to the chair of the English department at Princeton. A. Walton Litz told me of Emily Hale and her bequest to Firestone Library. Then he brought in Emily's friend, Willard Thorpe, whose wife Margaret had died not long before, in 1970, the year after Emily died. The two women had exchanged confidences, these scholars said. They had taken turns to write every fortnight on an understanding that each would destroy the other's letters. Waltlitz and Willard Thorpe hinted more than they said about a mystery in Eliot's life. I felt privileged to be there and a bit open-mouthed. Such was the dignity of Professor Litz that I was amazed by his lawless fantasy. If he knew he was dying, he said, it would be his last pleasure to steal into the archives, break open the boxes, and read the Emily Hale Elliot letters to satisfy his curiosity. And more, unspoken words hovered in the air. Then and there, I vowed to myself to live to this day when the letters could be read, and I have not been disappointed. Well, thank you, Lyndall, and you've given me so many more questions uh, to ask, and yes, I want I to I'd, have you expand on everything. Then. So uh, settle in, we'll be here for a few hours um, <laughs> to discuss all of this. But um, uh, I, I want to begin at, at the end, I mean, in, in, in my end is my beginning, as Ellen yes. said. Um, you were able to read the letters after first hearing about them uh, almost 50 years before, but in your book you uh, describe uh, very movingly Valerie Elliott's inability to, to read the letters. Yes. Mean, did you say something yes. about how they remained a yes. to her? Um, when Emily Hale decided to donate her cache of letters to Princeton, um, she did know that Elliot had this proviso that it must, they should not be opened for 50 years after the death of the survivor. But there was what one can only call a row between them when she actually decided to do this. At first, early on in their relationship, um, Elliot was very keen on preserving the letters. He, particularly Emily's letters, he stresses that in his letters to her. I mean, it was as soon, they had only written each other about eight letters when he began to talk about preservation. But once, uh, but when they reached this moment in 1956, when a, a, a row rose uh, arose between them, and one doesn't know the absolute source of that, he tore up certain of her letters. He made a complete about face and, and, and um, felt very uneasy about her sequestering the letters. And what I don't know, Bill, um, what I don't know, and we can't be sure, is when exactly he proposed to his second wife. There she was every day, putting on high heels when she went into his office to take dictation. He liked, he said, a tall girl. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't know when he just, but it was, the row with, with Emily Hale was between October and December 1956, and he proposed to Valerie Fletcher between October and December 1956. And the question open to all of us is which came first, the row or the proposal? Uh, but once he, um, Emily Hale, She'd always been very compassionate to him, very understanding and sympathetic uh, of, uh, 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 of the things he found wrong in his life. But she seems to have steeled herself 
it, at that period that she was, she was going to go ahead with this donation to Princeton. She was egged on by Willard Thorpe and Margaret Thorpe. I didn't know when I met Professor Thorpe in 1972 how important he was going to be in her story. But then uh, she, she, she was egged on by Willard Thorpe, Professor at Princeton, and by the librarian, Mr. Dix, at Princeton. They pushed her to ask certain favours of Elliot. They thought she had a hot line to him. In fact, he was getting more and more angry and tearing up her letters. What did he, he, he tore up four. So they asked, uh, suggested her to ask if the embargo could be from now, 1956. And then if he married Valerie, it would mean that she would be 80 uh, when she could, the letters would be released and quite likely still alive. And I, I suspect he didn't want Valerie to read those letters. And he, he was very angry about this and insisted that it had to be 50 years after the death of the survivor, which made it, as it turned out, 2020. And by then, Valerie Elliott had died. And, and, and she didn't get to see them. I did go to Princeton in 2019, a year before the letters were released, because I wanted to read more of the thought papers. And I spoke to the curator at that time, and he said that Valerie Elliott had pleaded with him <laughs> to allow her to see the letters. And he said, legally, quite reasonably, he could not, because he said when people make donations to an archive, they have to be honoured. And so he couldn't open the letters for Valerie. So, so that, that's the end. I mean, and Valerie, I think, had, had some sense of who Emily Hale was. She I did, mean, actually. Um, according to the present head of the Elliot estate, she was very close to Valerie Elliot. She said to me that Valerie Elliot did understand how important Emily Hale was in Elliot's life. So, did you ever meet Valerie? I, I was... Yes. Um, I did, um, when I was writing my first book, which was actually my dissertation at Columbia, um, Elliot's Early Years, um, it was to be published, and um, I was invited for lunch. And I've, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And we talked, as I remember now, about... about Dickens. I hadn't then. Uh, I hadn't then. No, she. Of course, we talked a bit about Elliot, but I hadn't realised until she mentioned it that Dickens was very important to Elliot, and of course she was then editing. She had edited the Wasteland manuscript with uh, its original, very unpromising title. He do the police in different voices, which was from our mutual friend. But um, uh, when when I thought about it more, I realised that there was something really to think about, uh, the relation of Dickens and Eliot, but I, we probably shouldn't digress on no, that. No, no. so I, I'm curious, though, I mean, this, this is your fourth book on Eliot, and uh, what's such a triumph about each of them is that each of them is completely different from the other, and, and so you've now written four books about over almost well, 45 years or so. Yes. Uh, the first book was published in 1977. Uh, so I'd like to talk about, one, how over these many years, you know, your views of Eliot have changed and how you have found so much new to say each time you've written. Yes. But then also, in, in particular, to say that, but then also talk about, in, as you were saying in your uh, introduction, so you knew about these letters in 1972, and I'd like you to say what you knew might be in them and how you conveyed that now that you actually know what's in them. <laughs> That's a lovely question, and I feel uh, it's, a, it's a huge subject. But um, really going back to my time as a student, uh, at Columbia, I was very determined to write a dissertation on Eliot, even though at that time there wasn't an Eliot scholar uh, teaching at Columbia. I found, in the end, I, I, I had uh, as my supervisor an Americanist, which suited me very well, in that I wanted very much to see Eliot in terms of his American background. In fact, I'd gone to Columbia to do American studies. Um, but um, I... Um, I actually already had an idea of 
what, to use her Henry Jamesian phrase, the figure in the carpet of Eliot's career. And I got that from my mother, who was, a, 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 she would make no claims for herself. She was a poet, but she was really a, a very keen reader of poetry and of Eliot in particular. And my mother seemed to understand the life between the lines. And so I came with this idea that Eliot, it wasn't a common idea in the early 70s that Eliot's life was unified. People at that time saw Eliot divided between a pre-conversion and a post-conversion religious poet. They thought of Eliot as a sophisticated atheist poet until there was a sudden conversion and then he was a religious poet. Whereas my mother had read Eliot um, as a very unified, she believed that he, he had an idea of the religious life from the start. And that was the question I took to the Burke Collection at the New York Public Library. I remember another biographer who lived near me in Oxford, Humphrey Carpenter, the biographer of Pound and Auden, saying to me that you have to go to an archive with a prepared mind or you'll get, or maybe his exact words, or you'll get seriously unstuck. <laughs> I was interviewing him at his request and we were talking about research. Anyway, I went, I did already go with an idea of asking of the manuscripts at what stage did Eliot become interested in the religious life? And the answer was loud and clear. So that was the heart of my first book, a poem Eliot wrote called Silence, which I thought a great poem, which he hadn't published in his lifetime. He wrote it in his last year as an undergraduate at Harvard when he was 21. But it is about um, an illuminating moment, a vision, if you like, uh, where all of life, all time-bound life dies down and the poet is enveloped, enveloped in a timeless silence. So that idea that Eliot was always interested in the timeless, in, in, in a spiritual search was there in the first book. And I think I may have put in Emily Hale just tangentially. I didn't know much about her then. But what happened when I published in 1977 was that people got in touch with me after publication. And Mrs. L. Smith, one, Emily Hale was the kind of person who had lifelong devoted friends, women friends. And Mrs. L. Smith was in her 90s was traveling, she was a feisty, delightful woman from the Midwest. I was then teaching at Jesus College Oxford and I remember she came to meet me there and she took my arm and we walked out on the broad. We went out for lunch and she told me lots about Emily Hill. So it went into the next book, Elliot, Elliot's New Life, um, which was published at the time of Elliot's centenary, the centenary of Elliot's birth in 1988. And that was a sequel to Eliot's early years. I used the, the title Eliot's New Life because by then I was re really reinforcing that sense of Eliot's single-minded pattern of moving through the standard stages of the religious life. That is going through a trough of despond, a wilderness, a waste, as in the wasteland, and then hopefully uh, coming out uh, moving through a purgatorial ordeal towards, hopefully, some heavenly conclusion. And Emily Hale was all the time in the back of his mind as a kind of Beatrice figure, a guide to heaven, both a, a real person and a guide to heaven. So in some ways, all the books are one book, but uh, with Eliot's new life, I, 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 I dealt with the latter half of Eliot's life and the plays. The third book was really a, a composite of the two, um, published by my same publisher as now Norton, um, and they treated it as a standalone new book. They did it, thankfully, in hardback as though it was a new book, but it was, it was a composite with, about, um, with a lot of um, material that had come to me from all sorts of places because I had published. Like Eliot helped to place, was really instrumental in placing his first wife against her will in an asylum. And um, 
I had a letter completely unsolicited out of the blue from a stranger in England saying that his mother had helped, had tried to help Vivian escape. I mean, I've put this into the present book. Um, uh, and so, I mean, that kind of detail about her attempt to escape from the asylum was wonderful and showed how again she was against being put away for life. And what, I mean, it, it illuminated for me Eliot's line in Four Quartets, things ill done and done to others harm. I felt that Eliot had a very dark side to him. I called that third book, The Imperfect Life. By then I knew he was imperfect, um, but I, I've never ever doubted the greatness of Eliot's as a poet. Uh, I, I think that he's, you know, well, as I said, one of the all-time great poets. Um, but he was also a man of, uh, uh, there was a dark side to him, and he was at the same time a man of conscience. So he suffered. He both did things that, you know, troubled his conscience, and he suffered for it. He's, he was very aware of sin. and. The American side of Eliot that I, I've tried from the start to bring out was his sense of kinship with his forebears who, were, who came to America in the 17th century. The first of that, that the American line was Andrew Eliot, who emigrated, uh, sailed from a, a, a near East Coker uh, in Somerset in 1669. But, but Eliot has, he constantly, from, well, at least from time to time, he refers to, to his sense of kinship with the strenuousness of those New England Puritans, the harshness. Um, and he, I think that his conversion to Anglo-Catholicism, I mean, Catholicism plays a very big part uh, in the kind of Anglicanism he adopted. Um, I think that is a kind of cover or parallel, I don't know quite what the word is, for what he wanted to retrieve in his own national past, which was the, 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 the Puritan period in, in early America. And that's why my my supervisor of my dissertation was very important to him, Sakhvat Berkovich, who went on to be professor of American literature at Harvard, and his special field was the Puritan period, and he spoke of Puritan continuities. What Eliot was, I think, felt within himself was true of the image of American literature that this professor wrote about. Um, and then the fourth book, Now, is really about the letters themselves. So uh, you say that you were always convinced, obviously, and you are, that Eliot was a great poet, and obviously Emily Hale was convinced of that for <laughs> all these decades. And I wonder if you could use that view that she had of him to explain both the things that drew them together yes. and then the things that persisted even when he created even more distance. I mean, they were mostly writing <laughs> transatlantically, so they were never yes. even it was rarely largely, in the same city. It was largely, as you say, an epistolary letter-writing relationship. They were distant, and in some ways this was inspired by Dante and La Vita Nuova, an early spiritual autobiography of Dante, which Eliot read and reread, and he also, of course, read Dante's great spiritual autobiography, The Divine Comedy. And at the time he met Emily Hale, he was reading Dante avidly, walking around with Dante in his pocket. Um, those uh, copies of Dante, um, three volumes, are quite small, and he could carry them in his pocket. He read, he learned passages by heart on long train journeys. Of course, he went by train in those days between Boston and St. Louis, where his family was. Um, and you can see in his, under, uh, his marginalia, his lines, uh, at, uh, those copies are at Harvard, what interested him in Dante, and of course, Beatrice was one of the figures in the Divine Comedy who interested him. Um, and so at the time, he renewed contact with Emily Hale 
1911. He'd been a year in Paris. He had Dante very much to the fore in his mind, and I suspect he already had um, a kind of template of, he said later in his life that Dante was the greatest influence on him. So that's one thing. But just before he returned to America uh, to take up a philosophy course at Harvard Graduate School at the end of 1911, he had been in Paris. And this was another template for his relationship with Emily Hale, which was to come to a peak in the years when he was a graduate student between 1911 and 1914, when he left for Europe. And a very important discovery, I'm really excited about it, is that at the time Eliot was in Paris, in June 1911, Diaghilev brought, brought the Ballet Russe uh, to Paris, and it was a sensation. And the hit of that Paris season was a ballet, Le Spectre de la Rose. And it suddenly, I, I read a, an obscure poem, nobody's paid any attention to it, in Eliot's notebook. He didn't publish it. And I have to say, it's not a very great poem, <laughs> but it's a Spectre de la Rose poem. It's about a man, a dancer, who takes a leap into a girl's bedroom. She's an innocent, she's asleep, and he dances. In Eliot's poem, he dances all night in her bedroom and then flies out of the window. That is actually the scenario for uh, Fokine's 12-minute um, Spectre de la Rose. And we're going to see yeah. a clip of that now. But I want to, just before John shows us the clip of this ballet, I want to just say a few words But watch for the entrance of the rose, the, ma the, man, the male dancer is the rose, and he enters with his arms furled like this at the window. It's a kind of incursion into this girl's life. And when he puts his arms back, it's almost like a halo. And there is an animal verve in his dancing that's both very masculine, and yet it's a kind of masculinity that is not afraid of its feminine side. And you will see in the second clip, there are two clips of this, a, an exquisite tenderness with which this, incur this man who is making an incursion from we don't know where into this girl's life, he treats her with exquisite tenderness. It's not, it's not conquest. It's a kind of arousal of her senses through the odour, through the perfume he emanates. And you'll see, I'm using a clip with Nureyev because there's no footage of Nijinsky. Um, but it was a very famous exit, by the way, that Nijinsky did when he flew through the window. People at the time said they never forgot it because it looked as though he would never come down. Uh, but watch in the second clip for the way Nureyev's arms move behind the sleeping girls. She's sleeping throughout this, this it's like a dream, this encounter. And he, his arms are wafting his arousing perfume towards her. Um, it's wonderfully sensitive. Anyway, here then, we are, we're going I'll... to see this clip.
just a bit sharply because I didn't want to take up too much of this time. But that was, I think, a template for the rose image throughout Eliot's poetry when he talks of love. And when he talks of love, he's thinking about Emily Hale and he often pictures her as in the hyacinth garden of the wasteland with her arms full of flowers. And then there's the rose garden in Burnt Norton and there's the rose of memory. So I'm very excited about learning of deciding that Eliot saw that ballet. And then the other important template in Eliot's life, uh, uh, love for Emily Hale, that makes its way, in fact, the earliest lines that were included in the wasteland comes from Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. And before I ask John to play us a clip from Act Three, I wanted to say that um, the Hyacinth Girl episode, this memory and desire scene of young love is introduced by the sailor's chorus in Act One of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde when Tristan and Isolde fall in love. And then in Act Three, um, when Tristan is fatally wounded and dying, um, the healing lady Isolde comes to him and for a while he is renewed and his heart thuds uh, pulses in his breast, and and Eliot uses uh, th that line, uh, uh, blood beating the heart in the finale of the wasteland, and he writes to Emily Hale uh, in his second letter, uh, that was. Alana, I was thinking of you. Uh, and when uh, uh, the, the background to that is that on the 1st of December 1913, Emily Hale invited Eliot to join her party at the Boston Opera House to see that. And I found um, in um, Eliot's collection of memorabilia the programme for that performance. I was able to date it exactly. And later on, when he writes to Emily Hale, he says, that was the night I realized I was in love with you. And so we're going to hear a clip now, John, from the, the Lebestot, the love song, uh, the, uh, the death-defying love song in Act Three. And this is, I may add, a concert performance, not a sung performance, because in 1935, so many years later, when Emily Hale came to London, Elliot took her to hear a, a concert performance. <laughs> with these two incredible templates for love. And, and then, as you said rightly, the relationship was to a large extent apart. They were on different sides of the Atlantic, but they did meet and there were embraces. Uh, so that it wasn't, as Eliot tried to convey in that letter to posterity, uh, the love of a ghost for a ghost. No, there was physical contact. I mean, that I, as this was playing, I was um, trying to think whether we know whether he took her hand or whether they were holding hands during this concert because the, their, their physical contact was so limited. I mean, both by Eliot's um, sense of rectitude, religious rectitude. Absolutely. And yes. um, uh, I, I was so moved by uh, something um, that... Uh, you say in the book that, it was, or I think it's Emily Hale writing to a friend, or maybe it's even to him, always a rare thing to hold close, but of a nature to be unfulfilled. And that their love was yes. close and yet so distant and so physically distant, uh, not only because they were on other sides of the Atlantic, but because that seemed to meet Eliot's moral and emotional and even physical yes. uh, yes. requirements. I mean, yes. Can you explain something about... Well, I'm not sure I can way. explain it 
um, with certainty. He did have a physical disability, which may have, I mean, he was a very inhibited young man. And um, he was also, I think, a well-sexed man. I mean, he thought about sex a lot. If one looks at some of the more scatological poems he wrote just for men only. And but, even but, these letters. I mean. And the letters are full of, I mean, he tells Emily Hale, he's quite open in the letters, like when I wake in the morning, uh, you know, I'm aroused, I'm thinking of you. Um, so, um, but he had um, a double hernia. He was congenital double hernia. He had to wear a truss and maybe he was shy about that. Um, so that's one possibility. But I actually think he was very drawn to a farewell relationship, a distant relationship. And I think it's quite strange that he never spoke to Emily Hale about one of his poems that does seem to me to be about her in their very early relationship, La Filia Che Piange, about a young girl who's weeping. And it's a, you hear um, an artist or dramatist or director's voice saying to the girl, stand there, turn, you know, throw your flowers down. It's all imperative. And he thinks, should we have come together? And he is drawn to the idea of coming together, but what he wants more is a work of art. It's, I mean, he wants parting. The girl's going to weep. It's going to be hard on her. It's like he's setting up the scenario there in a poem written in 1911 or 1912 for their whole subsequent relationship. And I don't think it's necessarily to do with something as... Um, ordinary as a trust. I mean, I think it has to do with a temperament that wants to put art before life. I mean, one, before we go to questions from the audience, I mean, what, what you make so clear in this book and in all of your books about Eliot is you know, maybe, as you say, it comes from uh, your mother uh, seeing the life between the lines, but you're one of the greatest biographers in your ability to read the poetry in the same paragraph as you are telling biographical details and to yes. mix those so seamlessly so that you are reading through the art, you're reading the life, and we are learning about the poems as well as we're learning about the biographical details, even if we're not familiar with those lines or that, that, that work of poet, you know, that poem or some of Eliot's plays. So the melding of that is, is so beautifully done in, in every book, including you the, the ones You put that beautifully. About... I have to say that when I did this initially in Eliot's early years, I had some savage reviews <laughs> because uh, it was taboo to mix. Uh, Eliot had laid down um, a, a kind of injunction that he was to be read as an impersonal poet. So it was taboo when I was a student to read, but Eliot used the word transmutation. You transmute life into art. And I think that's a very accurate way of seeing it. It's not that you're giving life flat on the page. You, it is being re recreated poetically. And I think that Emily Hale was always going to be a poetic love for Eliot, mm. which means that he was, although he tells her from time to time, I wish I were free to marry you, I believe, I can't prove it, but I believe that he never was going to marry her, whether he knew it or not, um, because she had to be for him that poetic image. And I think that harks back to La Spectre de la Rose, where there's never going to be consummation of that arousal when that rose makes his spectacular leap into that girl's room and dances around her. It's never going to be. And Eliot and Emily's love was n not consummated in any ordinary sense, but they did uh, sort of fall asleep together. And there was something very blissful in the sleep as Eliot describes it. It's so interesting when you say that, uh, their, their love you know, was not physically consummated. And then to think that the last crisis in the early 60s was put upon him by the Princeton Library's desire to have their letters mingled or, you know, in yes. the same collection. I mean, so, yes. you know, that, that if both sides would actually come together in the same library, it would be a Gosh. consummation it's that a, had never been achieved you, in life. It's a vivid idea. Yes, you put that really well, Bill. 
<laughs> so he, maybe that's why he destroyed it. Well, he, didn't, he didn't to, want that. You, you're being a really perfect reader because you're extrapolating from the facts that are there in the book. But I think you're right. Oh, well, so just <laughs> before we go to questions, quickly, if you could, uh, maybe this would be, I'm preempting a question from the audience, is why didn't Eliot marry her? Vivian dies in 1948, 47. Yes. And um, Emily Hale clearly expected... Absolutely, um, absolutely. She'd been waiting all these years. She'd been, I mean, Eliot had drawn her into this relationship. She'd held back. She didn't initially want to be... Um, associated with a married man. Um, but he'd drawn her in, and out of compassion, she had written to him. But, you know, from time to time, she had wanted him to think about marriage, perhaps divorce Vivian. And he kept saying, no, my religion doesn't allow it, but I wish I could marry you. So she was within... It was very understandable that she expected to marry Elliot. And then... Vivian died suddenly of a heart attack in January 1947, and Eliot conveys to Emily in his second letter to her after the death that he's found he has no more desire to get married. I mean, he writes, he says, I fear, or, you know, he has the fear that I have interfered with your life far more than I was aware of or had any right to do. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, talk about, Clueless or cruel, I mean, or both. I mean, it just seems like how, how uh, I was so struck. I have interfered, may have interfered may with have. your life far more than I was aware of. What was he what, thinking of what the 1131 letters? Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. I can't, uh, things ill done and done to others harm, <laughs> indeed. So I see we have um, a man who is, there's a kind of duality to Eliot. And he did, in fact, write an essay which was not published in his lifetime but is now collected about... This was in the early 1920s, uh, about duality in... He was talking about Dante and Dostoevsky, where a, a great writer lives on two planes, and two planes of reality. And the, the life you and I lead, our ordinary day-to-day -day life, is simply the veil of for another reality which is to lead towards um, in my end is my beginning. And so that you lead that other, almost surreal life, listening for voices, cultivating relationships that will attune you to the life to come. And Emily Hale was positioned by Eliot to do that. In fact, there was a meeting between Eliot and Emily Hale before they began this correspondence in London in 1923. Um, this is, can see from the letters. And, and Emily Hale asked Eliot a question which he wouldn't answer, but it was a question that bothered her greatly. She left that one meeting with a sense of finality. Uh, whereas Eliot left it, realising he was more in love with her than ever, and, but he wouldn't answer that question. Now, when this book was in process, it was being edited in London, my editor wanted me to cut that, because she said, we don't know what the question was. But I was stubborn about that, because I think it's a, an unanswered question is very important. And also, when they began to correspond, they hadn't forgotten it, because... Eliot said, makes excuses about it. He says, I couldn't answer it because it was involved too much talk about my first wife, my wife, mm -hmm. Vivian. But that wasn't, I think, the whole thing. I think that Emily, this is a guess for what it's worth, but I think Emily was asking him, what is your plan for me if I agree to correspond with you? What is in it for me? What, what... Uh, and, and I think he didn't answer because she was to be part of his poetic phantasmagoria. And what I love about this book is that the, the, the unanswered question hovers and yet there are so many questions that are answered oh, and so good. that we, we leave it so satisfied knowing as much as we do. And do you? Yes, yes. I mean, it's just such a... But you see, book. with somebody as great and complex as Eliot... There will be, I mean, I'm speaking as a biographer, I think there's no end to knowing. There's no 
way we can know the whole truth. And I think that is true of all of us. Is if, if we wanted to tell the whole truth about ourselves, we never could, could we? So I think biographers... Not here, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I think biographers have to always accept right. that the truth is limited. So I, think, I fear that we have left unanswered questions among the audience members. I yes. hope we have time for a couple of questions. But thank you, Lyndall Gordon, for the book and for today. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. We're dazzled. Um, I, I wonder how much you were frustrated <laughs> by not having Emily Hale's half of the correspondence or if you were able to intuit um, most of what you felt you needed. Were, were you frustrated by not having Emily Hale's side of the correspondence, or were you able to intuit oh, what you wanted to know Oh, that's an excellent question, and there's a very clear answer to your question. And that is that when Elliot is writing so frequently to Emily Hale, he is responding to material in her letters, and. Thankfully, he often quotes back to her what she's saying and gives his reply. So part of the challenge and actually the pleasure of writing this was to put together, as well as I could, a sense of what the issues were for her. Often the issues were matters of faith, for instance, where she was a devout Unitarian and he was an Anglo-Catholic. And um, it, it was more or less important to them to resolve these differences. But as she, for instance, one thing that is coming to my mind in answer to your question is within a, a few weeks of their correspondence, in about January 1931, uh, Emily Hale has said to Elliot, why, you're abnormal. <laughs> and he quotes back that word abnormal and he's completely confident and happy with it. He said, yes, I am. And it would, I, it would be more abnormal if I pretended to you I wasn't abnormal. Um, and it's, he, he, he's actually, there's something quite charming in his candor to her. And it, it, she goes on in letter after letter to press him. Her word is natural. She wanted a natural relationship. And he is saying, no, no, don't think of natural in the ordinary terms. Think of it in relation to the supernatural. So that was, it's natural versus supernatural. And he wanted her to give in, as it were, to surrender. He talks of it to her as a battle. He says, I mean to win, that you will give in to my idea that we're living to live beyond ourselves. Thank you for that. I think this is kind of a related question, but what did she make of her life? Did she sit in the chair waiting oh. for his letters to come? Oh, yes, that's another excellent question. But she, I did mention that she was an actor and a theatre director and a, a teacher of drama and speech. So she had, she was um, a very, um, she, she had a vocation. I mean, from the age of 13, she wanted to be in the theatre. And she was doing this against the will of her family because they didn't think it was proper uh, in 1913, 1914. But she was determined. And she made a life in the theatre for herself, even though she never acted in the commercial theatre. But I, I, I'm not, I, I think that she wouldn't want us to pity her. She was very fulfilled in her career in the theatre. And, and you compare her in, in the book as a teacher to Miss Jean Brodie. I've got a chapter, yes, the prime of Miss Emily Hale, because she had her special girls, her acting stage struck girls. She was a person who had devoted female friendships. And so, although she was undoubtedly lonely, and she tells Elliot she's lonely, um, and he never really helps her in, uh, with that issue, um, she does have a very fulfilling life, um, uh, and she does have a fulfilling career. Are we finished? Okay. Okay. Um.
Uh, well, I'm sorry to cut this a little... Well, I'm not cutting it short, but I know there may be more questions, but I think it was such a satisfying session. I found it incredibly moving. Um, and um, I feel it's fitting that for the first time, I think, in America, um, we've done, the just, done justice to the relationship between Emily Hale and T.S. Eliot and her impact on his poetry, which we all... Um, value so much and, uh, and appreciate so much. Thank um, so thank you, Lyndall, and thank you, thank you, Bill. Oh, thank um, you. Please uh, remember, if you want the full story of the relationship and the letters, you'll find them in Lyndall's book, The Hyacinth Girl, um, at the Buxton Bookstall, and obviously, you'll, you'll, if, if uh, Bill's book uh, uh, um, is also on sale in a Buxton Bookstall, and that focuses more specifically on the writing of the wasteland. Thank you all very much.